Welcome back for the second half of our symposium. And again, I'm just going to do a, a mic check. Can folks hear me in the back, in the back, in the front? OK, excellent, great. Um, <laughs> this afternoon, we will hear from two panels, one comprised of experts leading the way to prevent child sexual abuse in institutional settings, and then a second comprised of members from the Keepers documentary cast. Our first panel will be moderated by my friend and my colleague, Dr. Fred Berlin. Dr. Berlin is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He is an attending physician at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and he carries a joint appointment in my department, the Department of Mental Health, in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, Dr. Berlin founded the Johns Hopkins Sexual Disorders Clinic, where he serves as medical director, and he also founded and directs the National Institute for the Study prevention and treatment of sexual, sexual trauma, a program that has been designated by the United States Department of Justice as a national resource site. In his career, Dr. Berlin has addressed a White House conference on child sexual abuse, various subcommittees of the United States Senate, and the colleges of judges in several states. He's also provided consultation um, to the National Conference of Catholic Bishops and to the European Parliament. Dr. Berlin's media appearances have included, uh, but I'm sure are not limited to, uh, 60 Minutes, 2020, Nightline, Good Morning America, Larry King, Anderson Cooper, Face a Nation, you name it. Dr. Berlin has been there. His clinical, his research, and his policy efforts promote a more nuanced understanding of why people commit sexual offenses and how best to treat them to ensure that they don't do so again. It's my pleasure to bring you Dr. Fred Berlin, who will introduce and moderate our first panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, I'm not going to take a, a lot of time because I'm very interested myself in hearing what our panel members have to say. Um, I also uh, have just jotted down some notes in listening today and uh, ahead of time in thinking about um, uh, what I'd like to um, say to you because I, I don't consider myself to be an expert on um, the problems faced by institutions in dealing with the issue of child sexual abuse. Uh, but I do think there's some questions that, um, um, and some issues that I have become familiar with, and I just want to take five minutes to um, throw out there, and uh, perhaps some of our speakers will be able to address some of them. Uh, first of all, wh why is this such an um, important issue? And I think it's probably obvious uh, to most of us. Um, the institutions that we'll be talking about here, and it's true of many institutions, it can just be the, the local school or a daycare center, not just bigger organizations such as uh, Boy Scouts or the Catholic Church. Um, there are just large numbers of children that congregate together in these particular areas. And so although most of us are aware that much of child sexual abuse occurs within the home and within the family, when it comes to large numbers of children being at risk within a, um, a fairly confined setting, um, these are the places in which we need to be looking and, and trying to develop a reasonable and, and thoughtful approach. I think there are many challenges to these institutions, and again, I'll be interested in hearing from our speakers, uh, ranging from what needs to be done in terms of screening people that they bring in as staff members uh, to educating individuals once they ha actually become involved uh, as, as employees. Um, the sad fact is, in my judgment, and perhaps there's more for me to learn, that other than checking to see whether someone has had a prior criminal record or prior allegations made against them, there's not an awful lot more that can be done when deciding to hire an individual to work in an institution to know with a, a sense of confidence whether they may or may not be someone who potentially is going to pose a risk to, to the well-being of others. Once that people are on the staff, the problem or the issue, I shouldn't say problem, the issue then becomes one of education. Uh, I think there are a number of factors that need to be addressed when considering that, and also we need to be thinking about who it is we're educating. One of the things we have to do is to educate children who are uh, coming into contact with individuals in these institutions. Again, it's a challenge of how to do that. Uh, clearly, children cannot be made responsible for their own safety. Nonetheless, it's clear that there has to be policies and ways of being certain that children um, do know who they can do go to, what is or isn't acceptable. A major challenge, I think, for, for these institutions. Secondly, we need to obviously educate, educate the, the staff. 
I think there's also levels of concern when it comes to who's at risk of being abused and who might do it uh, that we don't always think about. I think uh, it's obvious uh, to most of us that we need to be very concerned that, that staff who are working in particular agencies not be the individuals who are going to end up posing a risk to, to children. These are the very persons who are charged with the responsibility of making sure that our youngsters are going to be safe. But there's others in uh, these settings that can pose a risk as well, uh, visitors who come into to schools. And uh, an area that I think is even less often thought about is the risk of uh, children committing sex offenses against other children. Uh, this can be a, a significant issue for places, for example, like the, the Boy Scouts. Uh, I think a lot of attention has been paid now to uh, those who are in a position of responsibility abusing. But there are numbers of instances that have been reported where older children in particular tend to exploit young children. Um, all of this has to be a part of the large picture that we're considering uh, when we address the, these issues. One of the things that's become a, a major focus of concern um, in a, a lot of institutions, we saw this with the terrible situation developed at Penn State, uh, had to do with the, the uh, matter of mandatory reporting. And again, uh, this is something that's easy to say. It's not always as easy as individuals might assume. Uh, there are various laws in different jurisdictions about uh, what the expectations are about reporting and when to report. If an institution is going to, and they absolutely should, I don't want to be misunderstood, obey all the mandatory reporting laws, then there has to be some clear understanding of uh, um, how, that, how one goes about this. What's the chain of command? Who makes the actual report? Is, is it a person who hears or, or learns initially? Or do they go to a superior? Uh, all of that, I think, uh, is very challenging and needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, I think there's also the issue of um, uh, how to implement policies. Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy, and I'm certainly suggesting that every institution that is involved with children has to have policies about how to protect them. But as much as we're talking about the significance of childhood sexual abuse, and it's a horrible thing when it happens, it, it's out there, it's pervasive, for the average person working in an institution, that individual still experiences this as an extremely rare event. Uh, you know, we're all busy. We're working day in and day out. We're trying to honor all the responsibilities that we have. And then suddenly, and something that rarely happens to, to most people in these institutions, there's some concern about whether or not abuse has occurred. How do we make sure that we keep this vigilance up? How do we keep it on the front burner? How do we make sure that the policies that we have put into place are actually going to be implemented in a, in a meaningful fashion? And then finally, I think, uh, what kind of oversight needs to be put into place to make certain that these uh, policies are adhered to? And it may be a very different kind of oversight when it comes to what happens in a public school system, for example, than what might happen in the Catholic Church or Boy Scouts of America and so on. Now, the other comment I want to make uh, briefly, these, these have to do with, I think, some of the issues that are important in terms of policies, implementing policies and protecting children in institutions. There's another part of this that I think is, is difficult to, uh, to, to think about. Uh, and I think if we're going to persuade others to listen to our concerns, we have to be willing to listen to their concerns. And so a couple of the points I wanted to make here have to do with the rights of the accused. It's, it's very easy to kind of dismiss that, to say that children have to come first, and they absolutely do. But we also have to protect innocent adults as well, and people that are concerned about the rights of the accused aren't necessarily just trying to, aren't necessarily disinterested in protecting children. They may have legitimate concerns that I think we need to be willing to listen to if we're expecting them to listen to us. And there's been some terrible cases that uh, many of you have heard about. The uh, McMartin case in California many years ago where the uh, owners of a daycare center spent many years in prison because of allegations that had been made. They were later released and it turned out those allegations were false. There was the case of the, the Duke lacrosse team, who I think was a lacrosse team if I remember right, who were falsely accused, but in the meantime got kicked out of school, their reputations were besmirched and so on. So I don't want to overstate that. We're here to think about protection of children, but I do want to make the point that if we want folks to listen to our concerns, particularly in the political arena, and to make sure that they implement policies that we think are important, we need to step back and listen to what their concerns may be and understand that if they have a different point of view, it isn't necessarily simply because they're not concerned about kids. I hope every responsible adult has those concerns. The other thing that I think complicates the problem 
is that institutions do have a sense of wanting to be able to protect themselves. They have lawyers that are hired to do that and, and so on. And the fact of the matter is that in this day and age, there can be lawsuits that can bankrupt institutions. There can be tremendous negative consequences to an institution. Now, again, I hope every institution is going to put the well-being of children ahead of just protecting the institution. But to ignore the fact that an institution may have legitimate concerns about its own survival, I think would be to, uh, to take a one-sided point of view that is going to make it hard for all of us to work collaboratively rather than in opposition with one another. The final comments I, I want to make before I um, uh, turn it over to the uh, panel is that um, we also need to discuss the matter of to what extent are institutions responsible for treatment, and if they are responsible for treatment, who are they responsible for ensuring gets that treatment? To what extent, for example, are they responsible for ensuring if there has been victimization in their institution that they make certain that those uh, youngsters who've been abused get treatment? How, how, how should that be implemented? What is the responsibility there? The other thing is important, I think, is do uh, institutions have a responsibility both to offenders and potential offenders? Um, this is a very vexing issue. I, I uh, had been asked um, at one point to act as a uh, consultant to the National Conference of Catholic Bishops when they were having their difficulties. And one issue is that they did take on responsibility for treating those who had committed offenses, but I think lost track of the fact that there were victims out there, and so we're too much on the, on the uh, side of the pendulum of worrying about it, treating the offender and not worrying enough about um, making sure that they understood the needs of the victim. On the other hand, if we're really going to ultimately prevent child molestation, the individuals who are responsible for this are those who engage in that abuse. We can simply demonize them, and we can call them monsters. I, I was terribly uh, touched by our opening speaker this morning, who talked about his history of abuse, and then to distress to hear him describe himself as a monster. Obviously, he's not a monster. He also made the point that many who have been abused go on to become abusers. Again, that's not an excuse. That's a reality. They're not all monsters. Unless we begin to try to develop policies that would enable people who potentially might be a risk to children to come forward and seek help and to provide that both within and out of institutions, we're failing to address one important pro of the problem, the problem of how do we make sure that we intervene with those who could pose a potential threat before they actually become offenders who, who damage our, 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 our kids. Uh, we have to have a role for, for criminal justice. It's extremely important that we do this. Uh, but the reason we're here today in the School of Public Health is that we also have to begin to see child sexual abuse as a public health issue as well. I think we've done well with that in things like drunk driving, for example. We, we want to sanction and hold accountable those who are drunk drivers. But we also talk a lot about preventing alcoholism, treating alcoholism, helping people who the victims of drunk driving. I would argue, and this is just my point of view, that when it comes to the issue of child sexual abuse, we still think, seem to think in many instances we can publish, uh, sorry, we can punish or legislate it away. Well, we have to have punishments, we have to have legislation, but I'm delighted that we've got here in the School of Public Health the recognition that it also is a public health problem, and unless we address it from that point of view, both within and outside of our institutions, uh, we're going to fail to address an important component. Now, with that in mind, uh, we have uh, folks here from um, uh, some institutions that uh, are, are very important in all of this. Uh, the Boy Scouts of America, uh, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and also uh, uh, DSS. I do want to add in um, introducing these folks, particularly for places like the church and the Boy Scouts and so on, uh, in terms of my experience over the years, we absolutely have to hold accountable organizations that have failed to take the proper steps to protect our children. But I also want to make the point, and I've seen this firsthand, that within every one of these organizations are good people who are very concerned, who are trying very hard, who want to do the right thing. And I think in talking about the problems and needing to hold accountable those who've made mistakes, we also want to acknowledge those, and I think we have some people here on the panel today, who are within these organizations doing the right things, and I think we want to give equal uh, attention uh, to, to that issue as, as well. Uh, now, uh, having said that, let me introduce, I'm going to introduce all four of our panelists, and uh, again, the lighting here isn't great, so I'll try my best to... 
to read what I have to, to say here. Um, but I'll introduce them all um, um, at this point, and then I'll turn it over to them, and each of them will have 10 or a little bit more minutes to, to, to make a few comments. So first of all, from the um, uh, Boy Scouts of America, uh, Michael Johnson, the uh, Youth Protection Director. Uh, Michael has been the uh, uh, director uh, for the Boy Scouts of America in that position, where he leads the organization's efforts to continually enhance youth protection policies and procedures and ensure the safest possible environment for its youth members. An internationally recognized expert on child sexual abuse detection and prevention and a 28-year law enforcement veteran, he has overseen youth protection for the Boy Scouts of America since 2010. His team works every day to ensure sustained vigilance on youth safety issues across the organization through mandatory policies and procedures, including training and ongoing engagement with staff, volunteers, members, and so on. And as I said, it's a huge challenge, not only staff, those who are volunteering. Uh, it's, uh, I tip my hat to, to folks who are working so hard in, in this area. Uh, prior to joining the Boy Scouts of America, um, Mr. Johnson served as a lead child abuse investigator for the uh, Plano Police Department. He holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice with a minor in psychology from Southwest Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. And so he will be our first speaker and delighted to, to have him uh, here. Uh, our second speaker um, is from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. As I mentioned, I'd had some experience with them uh, myself. Uh, that's Bernie N N Nahardra. I hope I'm not messing your name up too badly. <laughs> I apologize if I had. And he is the executive director uh, of the um, Secretariat of Child and Youth Protection with the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, prior to coming to Washington, D.C. to uh, uh, work in that area, he had directed the Office of Protection for Children and Vulnerable Adults within the Diocese of San Jose, California. Uh, Bernie is a military veteran, a, a permanent deacon, uh, and uh, married with, with two children. Uh, our third speaker today, and again, I want to be careful if I don't pronounce your name correctly. I sincerely apologize. So, uh, Jules Reese Cologne, did I mess it up too badly? <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. I <laughs> appreciate that. Um, she is uh, the National Vice President of Child um, and Club S Safety for the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. In this capacity, she's been responsible for leading the child safety policies and initiatives for more than 1,100 boys and girls clubs, organizations, and nearly 4,300 boys and girls club locations across the United States, including those located on native lands and military bases. Again, tremendous challenge, extremely important work. Uh, formerly, she serves as Executive Director of Prevention and Outreach for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, she led their prevention and education programs related to child abduction and sexual exploitation, and her delivery to children, families, and the public, uh, and uh, she has uh, done that uh, and been with them for a period of 15 years. Her professional experience also includes leading prevention outreach initiatives with youth serving organizations, serving families, educators, law enforcement, and diverse communities. She's an experienced child advocate and serves as an expert on issues related to child safety. She's a graduate of Virginia Commonwealth University where she received degrees in both criminal justice and Spanish. She also holds a degree from um, Pro Proyecto Linguista. I'm gonna mess that one up. She's got another degree from a university in Guatemala. Forgive me on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, uh, but certainly least but not last, uh, from the um, uh, DSS, uh, Michael Piercy is the director of the Washington County Department of Social Services. He began his career in child welfare with the Baltimore City Department of Social Services 24 years ago. He previously served as the Washington County Child Protective Services Program Manager and the Clinical Director of the Washington County Child Advocacy Center for Sexual Abuse and Trauma Treatment. He also worked as a child marriage and family therapist for LDS Family Services. He is a Maryland licensed clinical social worker and licensed clinical supervisor and has been credentialed in trauma-focused uh, cognitive behavior therapy, uh, dialectical behavior therapy, emotion-focused therapy, and parent-child interaction therapy. So I think it's clear we have some wonderfully distinguished individuals here. It is clear that the tremendous challenge that they face, and I applaud them for taking on those responsibilities. I look forward to hearing from each of you, and I'm sure we'll save some time for questions at the end. And I'm not sure if you have a preference. The order I had you here is that I was starting with uh, with Michael. So um, if you want to change, that's fine. But otherwise, that's 
the order I introduced you in is the order I have here. All right, so, sir. That okay. sounds good. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here representing youth protection efforts of the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, first off, before I start, I got to comment on uh, earlier speakers, but specifically Delegate C.T. Wilson. Uh, every time you have the opportunity to listen to a survivor of abuse, it's very important to not only listen to uh, the, what happened to him sexually, if you will, that abuse, but to listen to and pay attention to the dynamics that occurred uh, in his life prior to that event. It was mentioned earlier, and it wasn't mentioned enough, and it kind of sets up some of what we're going to talk about, uh, at least from the Boy Scouts of America, the involvement of polyvictimization or ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and the responsibility uh, we believe at the Boy Scouts of America that we have in doing a better job of recognizing those things. We believe that that is one of the significant areas of preventing overall sexual abuse, and as the one of the largest advocacy organizations for youth. Uh, that's something that we're uh, definitely working on doing. My efforts, our efforts uh, at the Boy Scouts of America include uh, responsibility at a national executive board level, level, which we actually have a committee at that level in our organization. Our leadership is definitely engaged. Our chief scout executive is engaged in creating a safe environment for all scouts. I think you know also that we're looking forward to the opportunity of including girls in the program and giving them the opportunity to earn that distinguished eagle rank, which I think they as long deserved. Um, but when we look at youth protection, I look at it from a, if you will, and I'm not an MD, a medical perspective, the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary. All the efforts that we engage in to prevent it, all the efforts we engage in to recognize it, and, and then how we respond. Real quickly, um, as doctor pointed out, we, I, our team is responsible for educating not only our youth, and, and Dr. Berlin is correct, we realize that it's the adults that are responsible for protecting kids. However, the vast majority of the time, kids are out there engaging in activities with other kids or other adults when responsible adults aren't around, whether they're in a scouting program or within their families. We have just recently engaged some of the top experts in the nation, really excited about that. And we created a, which it turns out to be one heck of a laundry list of the various issues that are impacting youth in America. Uh, these issues that are impacting youth also impact their families. Our organization has made the decision that we're going to uh, welcome that and be a part of the solution to addressing a lot of those issues. So that's going to be a very exciting aspect of our programming and our training uh, going forward. We require all of our parents to not only register their kids, but we also have what we call a, a parent handbook that we require them to review with their kids, which is part of the scouting program. Uh, the secondary, we have a mandatory training. We call it youth protection training. If you know anybody that's involved in scouting, they're very f familiar with that term. I literally wear a pen that says youth protection begins with you. It's a responsibility of every leader, parent, and adult in our program to ensure that they create that safe environment. But they got to know what to do. And so part of what our training is, I hope all of you have the opportunity to take our training, is literally focused on uh, providing those leaders and those parents with specific information on how these individuals groom kids in each topical area of abuse, the neglect, the emotional abuse, the physical abuse, the bullying, how all those areas, exposure, experiencing violence, all those areas uh, create these opportunities for a perpetrator to identify and engage these youth. So can't get into that a lot. I don't I want to be respectful of everybody else's time, but we've got survivors in our training and no one does a better job of explaining, as you saw this morning, the importance of this topic, to engage people, to reach into their hearts and into their minds, to take this topic seriously. The topic of child sexual abuse is scary for most people. It, it really is. Obviously, it's incredibly scary for the kids involved, but for the individuals and the adults, and I think that may have something to do with some of the irresponsible responses, is because they don't know what to do with this particular topic. Now, I'll be honest with you, for Dr. Boleyn, for Dr. Letourneau, for myself, my colleagues up here, it's really not hard, because that's what I was 
trained to do. I've done that hundreds of times. But for the other people, it's difficult. So it's always a challenge for us to educate those parents and those leaders on a topic that most in society don't even want to acknowledge exists and to make it okay to have that conversation. In 2018, it's a heck of a lot easier to have that conversation than it was in 1990, than it was in 1980, than it was in 1970. And Dr. Berlin and Dr. Letourneau can give you a much better perspective of that history because that's the area that they work in. Tertiary, and I'm gonna, I've got a bunch of things to talk about, but I'm gonna stop after that. One, once, it, once the incident has occurred, or the incidences or whatever has occurred, how that organization responds is literally going to be defined um, most appropriately by that child victim survivor and secondarily by the parents. We must and we will do a better job. Dr. Berlin said, is it our responsibility? I don't know if it is technically, but at the Boy Scouts of America, it is. We have what is literally referred to as scout help. You can Google it, or, but I can tell you how it works. If we identify a victim or survivor of abuse and scouting, whether past or something that's going on present, uh, they have access to free counseling, period. The counselor of their choosing in their community. We don't select them or what have you. That is something that's gonna, that we do and we, that we have. The other part of our tertiary response, we have a, a group, a team of experts that are trained, some of them with social work backgrounds, and how to respond when we have we, what's called a scout, uh, uh, scout help hotline, if you will. That's a 24-7 hotline. And it's not an abdication of our reporting responsibilities of child abuse, but the fact of the matter is, and I don't think research addresses it, most people, when they suspect abuse, need somebody to talk to about what they've seen, these behaviors. Most training says, well, you need, if you suspect abuse, you need to call the police, and that's true, or report it to DCSS, but that's not how people operate. They typically need to bounce it off somebody and talk to somebody. So along with that, we as an organization, BSA as a national organization, have a mandatory reporting of child abuse policy. If you have the opportunity, I would suggest you go to our website, look at our policies. My, my opinion, if, if I may, they're iconic. Two deep leadership, no one-on-one. -on -one. These are the very policies that we created 20, 30 years ago, which are applicable in most prevention uh, programs. But I'll say this, what we do at the Boy Scouts of America should not be, and I think one of the experts this morning talked about it, should not be applied to every other program because different program missions are different. There may be some other things that they can do to ensure safety. Maybe not, and that's part of the discussion or the evaluation, uh, but that's something that uh, should take place. But our mandatory reporting of child abuse policy, regardless of what your state says, whether or not Boy Scouts of America is a mandated reporter in your state, we at the Boy Scouts of America have made everybody in our organization mandated reporters of abuse, period. Plain and simple. If you study this particular issue, you realize that many states, it's very inconsistent. So if you sign up to be a leader or participate in the Boy Scouts, you've signed up to be a, a mandated reporter in Belize. And there's a lot more to that, uh, but I'll stop there to kind of give you a kind of overall uh, comprehensive picture of some of our efforts to keep kids safe. Well, thank you. And I think that number is really important, but just to highlight the one, because I haven't thought that much about it. Um, you're right. It is usually the case that if someone needs to make a report, they would like to have someone else to talk to. Obviously, it shouldn't be someone that impedes it, which needs to be a Correct. facilitator, but uh, yes, it's something I hadn't thought much about. I know, and having made reports over the years, I really do try to talk to colleagues. Sometimes, if necessary, we may have to cons uh, talk to the institutional attorney, but th to not have to do it alone, I think, is one of the more important points you made out of many of the important points that Thank you, you very made much, today. Sir. Yeah. Okay, the, the next person I have in uh, line, so this is just the order I introduced you in, was uh, uh, Bernie. So if you want to make a few comments, uh, I'll take it from there. Thank you, Dr. Fred. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you this afternoon and to share with you what the Catholic Church in the United States is doing to deal and address the issue of child abuse, child sexual abuse, uh, particularly also with the clergy. Uh, now, how many of you remember, I, I remember this, uh, as a kid growing up, being able to go out on a Saturday morning with my buddies on our bikes, and we would go out for a ride, and my mom would end up telling me, I want you home before the street lights. How many of you remember that? <laughs> All right. It's not like that these days. <laughs> I have two adult children at this point, and I remember when they were younger, grade school, high school, whatever, moving into a new neighborhood, and I'm military, I would do recon 
uh, this wonderful this wonderful thing called uh, Megan's Law, Megan's Law, and try to find out where our offenders are. You find out in your neighborhood. Around the corner is a house that's not necessarily safe. I would bring the kids in our little SUV with their friends and say, drive around there and tell them, look, this is not a safe place. This is not a safe uh, house. If you see any kids hanging out, come get me. And I would be at the point where when my kids wanted to go out and play, I wanted to be able to see them. Wow, shoot, are you kidding? When I was a, a kid, I was all over the place. And the other thing about that is this. As a kid, I could go out around the town in the neighborhood. I do something wrong. By the time I get home, my mom already knows about it. Because Ms. Smith already called mom and said, you know what your boy's been doing? Next, and, and so there was that communication. There was that community. There was that, that effort where, what was that? The village to raise the child? The village is different, completely different. And so the church, and I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna add a preface before I begin this, yes, we messed up. I wanna publicly make that comment. The church messed up. But the church has learned from this and has evolved from this. What used to be the reality of avoid scandal at all costs is now the reality that that scandal is what's gonna kill us. And so instead of putting and listening and, and having the survivor victim be able to tell the story, and it's been my experience that for a number of survivor victims, you know what, all they wanted was someone to hear their story. All they wanted was just someone to genuinely listen to what they had to say and genuinely apologize and find out and make sure it's not gonna happen again. We've since learned from that. And as a result of the, the, the 2002 Boston uh, Globe's headline, yeah, the spotlight movie, all of that. The church has made a dramatic shift and change. And what we're looking at at this point is this change in culture. And this is what's gonna have to happen society-wide as well. You're gonna hear a bunch of C's this afternoon in my presentation, and this is coming to you courtesy of the United States Marine Corps uh, in terms of leadership. And the C's are competence, courage, consistency, compassion, communication. So in terms of the application of these four C's with what the Catholic Church has been doing, in 2002, June of 2002, as a result of the Boston Globe and, and the reality, the church was aware this was a problem, this was an issue. Thank goodness for this Boston headline. It has now come to the forefront. The bishops had to deal with this. And as a result of that, another C, the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People. And in this charter, we have four main themes divided into 17 articles that was a template guideline for 197 dioceses around this country to put in place policy, procedures, programs, individuals to deal with, to journey with anyone who has been abused, anyone who has experienced this type of hurt, this type of harm, and to also deal with the uh, pr uh, priest offenders. So basically, in a nutshell, what we have here with the Catholic Church is threefold. Prevention, education, accountability. For prevention, what do we have? Every diocese in the United States now, and 197 of them, and this is slowly now coming out and rolling out internationally. Uh, Dr. Loterno can attest to this in the meeting that we were at last October in Rome. Every diocese in the United States has a victim assistance coordinator and a safe environment coordinator for the diocese. And in many dioceses, they have parish identified individuals who can deal with these issues if it happens on the ground level with the parish. So we wanna make sure we have someone who is competent who can handle that call, that allegation, because in many cases, you only have that one chance. You better get it right. So you're making sure you're documenting, you're making sure you're being consistent, you're making sure you're carrying out what you need to do. I tell these to folks when I do my trainings nationally and when I go around internationally as well, you will fight the way you train. And I apologize for the military language, but that's the background I have and I firmly believe it. The type of training that you have is the type that it's muscle memory. What, uh, what Mike talked about here with, you know, you have a situation coming up, yeah, you're a mandated reporter, but what do I do? What do I, if you've been training, if you've been practicing, if you've been rehearsing, if you've been looking at, if you know your chain of command, if you know your policies, no hesitation. And you know what? It's done with confidence. Another C. So we're looking at this reality of changing the culture. We have education in place. Every diocese provides safe environment training for all of our children, as, as Dr. Berlin said, but also for parents. If you're gonna be working with any of our minors, you will be trained. All of our clergy are also trained. Anyone that's coming in that wants to talk to or have access to our children from outside of the diocese, they are vetted, they are looked at, they are required to have training as well, and they will be a line of sight. We do two up, two deep. We followed the Boy Scouts as well, just to make sure you can never be too safe, right? 
All you really need is one allegation. And I have to say, from the time that uh, 2002 with the John Jay study that came out with this comprehensive look at what's happened in the church from 1950 to 2010, uh, the numbers are slowly starting to decrease, but one is still one too many. This current uh, annual report, we will find, you will see, and this will be available uh, uh, summertime, uh, 26 allegations involving minors in this day and age, 26, and you know what, that's just, that's for those who reported, right? So we always know this iceberg model, right? That's just a tip, who, who else knows? So the reality of the education is this, we want people to know, we want people to be aware, we want people to be armed with what to be able to do, so if something happens that's untoward, they know exactly what they need to do. Children are trained, adults are trained, everyone is trained. We do background checks on everyone who's coming in uh, to work uh, in the Catholic Church. You can go to any Catholic parish right now, and if you want to work in youth ministry, confirmation, any of the minors, they will require that you be uh, background checked, that you be trained, that you fill out an application, that you be interviewed. Uh, currently, at this point, we've had uh, 3.2 million people who've been background checked and a little over 5.3 million people who've been trained uh, so that we can make sure that our children are safe. In addition to what we have also on the national level, we have a bishop's committee that is dealing with this very seriously, representation from all 15 regions. We have a lay board, the National Review Board, composed of 13 experts from around the country as well that help to advise and give consultation to the bishops. We have my office that's headquartered in Washington, D.C. that tries to help to organize and be resourced to the dioceses and to the local level. We also implement an annual report, and we also, that annual report is the outcome of our annual audits that we do every year for all of our dioceses. And every diocese also has diocesan review boards that helps their bishop to deal with allegations that are coming forward. Uh, the idea of transferring clergy, that's, 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 that's no more. If an allegation comes in and the language of zero tolerance also, this is coming from Rome as well, that is a language that's being kept and held to. If you have one instance of that, you are no longer. You either put administrative, administrative leave, you're lay aside or removed from the, uh, from the clerical state, uh, or your, your, your ministries are restricted. So we have education that's been taking place, prevention, so that we, we, have, we have folks that know what to do in case something comes on toward. The accountability in terms of our, of our audits that take place uh, on an annual basis. Um, at this point, too, this is becoming public knowledge. We're putting out to bid for our new, uh, new round of selections for our third party outside uh, auditors to take a look at our, uh, at our diocese. Our current auditors right now are Stonebridge Business Partners. Prior to that, it was the Gavin Group. Uh, so we're looking at that. We are trying to keep the works that we are doing open and transparent. The reality now that the church wants to make sure they're doing right. They're making, they're making amends for what they have done wrong. The problem with the situation that had become before, and the bishops have realized this, they've know, they know this, they have learned this, it was bad enough that the abuse occurred. What was worse was the cover up. And the bishops have made a promise to protect, to heal, this is a promise that they have made sure that they are gonna keep. The reality of making sure our young people are safe is a core value in the church. It's a primary mission of the church. The reality now is this, we are looking at changing the culture, a mindfulness that everyone has, situational awareness, a mindfulness, and the reality that all of us are gonna make sure that we're gonna protect our children. What we're hoping to be able to do with all of this work in addition to uh, uh, rolling out of a program of HRO, High Reliability Organizations, we're very excited about that program. We're working very closely with other organizations such as hospital settings to make sure there's that consistent process, learning by case studies, et cetera. The hope of all of this is that in the end, abuse of any kind, not just child abuse, but abuse of any kind will not be tolerated. And that we be able to be uh, our brothers, our sisters keepers, We'll make sure that any of the victims that come forward will be heard. Uh, we want to make sure that this transformation, change in culture of our institution of the church becomes one where the church becomes healthier and holier. Um, and hopefully with this change and with this time, what happens is that when my children's children come up uh, to that point and I get to enjoy them as grandpa, whatever the case may be, they may be able to go out and get on that bike ride and mm -hmm. come home when the light comes back on. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, again, I'll just make a, a brief comment. Uh, it's, it's very encouraging to see how an institution, particularly as large as the Catholic Church, is able to respond to tragedy by making up its mind to 
uh, and implement uh, uh, the, the proper changes. Uh, um, I'm not Catholic myself, but, but faith is so important in the lives of all of us, and to be able to restore faith, to be able to have people who need to turn to the church in moments of need, once again, have that, I think is so important. And it was very encouraging to hear the, the dramatic steps. And I know what a challenge it is. It's, it's almost, parts of the Catholic Church are almost like states' rights rather than federalism when it comes to the different dioceses. And to be able to implement this across the diocese, to get it to be a national policy, uh, obviously there's more work to be done, but I think tremendous beginning, and I'm delighted to, to hear that. Uh, next speaker in uh, order is uh, Juris. Again, am I, if I'm not saying your name right, please yeah, correct right. me. Did I get it right this time? Uh, okay, <laughs> so you're, you're next in line, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing your comments. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Uh, so to understand what Boys and Girls Clubs of America does when it comes to child safety and creating a culture of safety, it's really important to understand the organizational structure. Um, so we are a federated organization uh, with approximately 1,100 individual 501c3 organizations underneath us. Um, under Underneath them are approximately 4,300 individual locations, uh, and our locations are scattered all across the United States, uh, native reservations, uh, military bases, uh, here and abroad. Uh, and so every one of those organizations has their own governance, uh, which can be a little tricky when you're talking about child safety and making sure that uh, pieces that have been put in place for protection are actually adhered to. Um, so as a national governing organization, we do quite a few things to make sure that our organizations, uh, you know, first and foremost, protect children, uh, but also follow the, the standards that we set forth to what we believe is a safe uh, and, um, and welcoming club. Um, you know, and so you know, when we first started this boon uh, for our Boys and Girls Club in the 90s, our big focus was around buildings, right? Because we had so many facilities all across the place. We were, we'd inherited a building, people rented us buildings for a dollar, you know, we got a little bit of everything. Um, and when you do that, you end up with spaces that might not be as conducive to safe environments as you'd like. Um, and so we really started to focus in on the, the building itself to make sure that everything was glass and that there was, weren't any hiding places, um, and really to make sure that the building was a, a, a great place, right? And then as we did that, um, you know, fast forward 20, 30 years, you know, we've since, you know, put in place more than 40 different changes when it comes to safety. Some of them include facilities, of course, but we've certainly honed in on the people that are inside those buildings. Um, you know, of course, you know, as every organization organization who's sitting up here, you know, background checks was certainly the first thing that we started on because that certainly serves as a baseline. Um, but we can't, we didn't, we can't, we, we didn't stop there. Uh, while background checks are certainly important, we also felt it was important to make sure that as our organizations were hiring the right staff, hiring the, volu the right volunteers, and keep in mind there are 50,000 staff that work with Boys and Girls Clubs and 250,000 volunteers serving more than 4 million children a year. Um, so it's a lot of people, um, and you have a lot of uh, area there that can open up you yourself for risk. Um, and so, you know, one of the really important things that we really focused in on was making sure that organizations understood how to interview people using behavior-based questions, um, just trying to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, but we also wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be guilty of passing trash, right? We've heard that term a couple of times throughout the day, and, you know, we weren't going to stand for it either. Um, and it's part of a requirement of our membership. If anybody works at a Boys and Girls Club um, and they're looking for another job, at a Boys and Girls Club, it's the duty of the, the new club to pick up that phone and get a, and get a recommendation. Um, and so that's just one piece of it, right? Um, we recently went through um, a membership change where, and it really, because we're federated, it really takes an act of Congress almost, right, to, to get changes pushed through. Um, but, you know, we, we had a historic vote because we've been pushing this notion of, you know, we really want to have the safest uh, place for kids. We want to create a culture of safety, and we've got to start that with the top. Uh, and so we actually have quite a few uh, pieces in place around leadership. You know, I, I think you heard earlier, particularly with the Royal Commission, that you know, it really was necessary for leadership to be invested in what you were doing and, and being invested in um, the safety and security of children from the top down. Um, so not only as a, from our governance model do we have uh, a committee that reports directly to the board around safety, we've also required that each and every one of our organizations, all 1,100 of them, who also have their own boards, have a safety committee as well. Uh, and those safety committees review a, a, a variety of things, everything from buildings, emergency operations, 
um, but to hiring practices and to abuse prevention training. Uh, we also do a lot around policies, and, and I think everybody in the room knows that a policy is only as good as the person who's implementing it, right? Um, but you know, we got to have them in place anyway, because uh, it's a starting point. Uh, and we really focused in on some of the data that we were collecting as an organization to see, you know, wh what were the pieces we were missing? Where were the, the places that we needed to be most concerned with around policies? And it's not just making sure that you hire the right person, or it's not just that you have a policy on cell phones, uh, but we were really digging a little bit deeper to focus in on how, how kids were using the bathroom, right? Like for an organization in a building, the bathroom is a hiding place. Um, so how can we make bathrooms safer? How can we make sure that the kids that were transporting to and from clubs, from school to their homes, were safe on those buses and those vans? Uh, how can we make sure that we're not putting uh, any child in a place or in a, in a situation where they are uh, alone with an, with an adult, right? Or even a, a child who might be older than them. Um, so putting in solid policies in place was really key, but really working with our organizations to turn those policies into practice uh, was really much more important. Um, and so we've really been doing a tour um, to all of our clubs um, to really make sure that the policies that they have in place are actually doing them well. Um, and it goes everything from, again, the, the restroom usage, but also how we um, how we supervise kids um, and how the, the ratios are from, from one program to another. Uh, and really helping to build organizations and helping to build that solid relationship with, with, with adults. I mean, that is really the, the secret sauce of the Boys and Girls Club is that, you know, kids look back and, you know, 5, 10, 20 years later and they, they can pinpoint that one person in the club that made a difference. Um, and we want to make that, that person, we want to make that organization the safest place possible. And to do that, we had to work on our staff. Um, and so we have club directors academies. We have youth development institutes. Uh, we have a variety of training opportunities for our, our uh, executive directors, our CEOs, our boards. Um, because, it, again, it doesn't just start and stop at the board level. And it certainly doesn't start and stop at the, at the program level when you're in a, in a boys and girls club. Every person in the organization has a responsibility for to keep kids safe. Um, and we try to hit every one of those people as often as we can um, when it comes to prevention education. And it, granted, there's a lot of pieces around safety that we're focused on. Um, but certainly, child sexual abuse prevention is one that we are keenly aware of um, and don't want that uh, or any sort of uh, activity like that happen in our clubs. Um, so we continue to put po those policies and practices in place and, and really work to our, with our organizations to refine those. Um, because what's good today may not be good tomorrow. And we've certainly found that I've been with the organization, I guess, almost two years now. Uh, and you know, even from two years ago, we've dramatically changed. And I expect that we'll continue to do so because every, this 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 field and this issue continues to evolve. Um, and we, as youth serving organizations, really have to be the one leading the charge there because that's where the kids are. Uh, and it's it's I think it's our our duty um, to do that. So. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Again, I, I just make one brief comment. Uh, I know all of us working in this area really want to make a difference. And what I'm impressed by, and we have a long way to go, but it's just how far we've come. I mean, uh, you know, it wasn't all that long ago when these kinds of issues weren't even being discussed. And to see large institutions who come into contact with so many children having made such significant change, having put this on the front burner, implementing policies, looking how to improve them, uh, I, I just think it, it's, it's uh, very encouraging to, to see how far we've come in this very important uh, effort. So again, thanks to all of you. Uh, Michael, I think you're the only one who hasn't spoken yet. Yet, so I'll turn the podium over to you. Well, thank you. Sure. Well, I, I'm a long time, uh, what are you saying, uh, child protection worker. Um, I come to this, though, from the heart of a therapist. That's my real enjoyment. That's where I really get my energy in life. And when I come to this, one of the modalities I was trained in was emotion focused therapy, which is grounded in attachment theory. And so, what makes sex abuse so different than sexual assault or stranger rape? is that there's a relationship involved. There's a bond of trust. And so when you violate that bond, you've done more than just attack the physical individual. You've destroyed a relationship. And so as a therapist, I love metaphors. And the metaphor I would use is if I took this glass of water here and put in one drop of ink, I have now colored this entire glass of water. The same thing happens throughout the entire lifespan of that individual who's just been violated and who's suffered that relationship violation. Because other relationships they have in our life, where do we find our greatest joys, our 
greatest sadness. It's in relationships. And so you've just violated that person's ability to interact with other people for the rest of their life. And they're going to spend the rest of their life possibly processing that, moving forward, stepping back, um, working in that arena. Um, unfortunately, in child sex abuse, and I'm from Washington County, Maryland, the sad truth is many of the families who suffer child sex abuse are known to us. And, many, and there's a strong correlation between the sex abuse victim and poverty. Something that we promote in our county is uh, um, something called the Paramore Principle. Meaning that, and this came out of the state of Illinois when they were looking at associated factors associated with child um, child sex abuse victims, was that if there was a paramour, meaning a boyfriend, typically, I mean there are some girlfriends too, but overwhelmingly, it's the boyfriend or a stepdad, the likelihood that there was going to be abuse went up exponentially. So it didn't just double, but it went up exponentially. Not isn't predictive. So I'm going to say everybody who's got a stepfather is going to be abused. I'm not saying that. It's not predictive, but is associated with when you go, do the regression studies with the abuse victims. Now, the problem with this, and I'm thinking about youth service organizations. Many of our single moms, and, I, and this has happened again and again, um, when they have one, these wonderful service organizations, these, these organizations who are charitable, they're very friendly with their kids, the moms see this as a relief, frankly, that, oh, there's somebody else taking time with my son or taking time with my daughter that I don't have to get them because I'm working hard. I'm working three different jobs to kind of maintain the rent or, or trying to put food on the table. Regrettably, that's a, that's a huge opportunity for abuse. Um, and so I, I applaud all three really uh, of these organizations because what something you also hear me and, and my staff will know is get people background checked. I sound slightly paranoid. I don't trust anybody. I know. And, and something I tell my moms is, uh, my moms that we're working with in Child Protective Services or Family Services is, look on Maryland case search if they've got drug history, violence history, not a person you probably want to bring home to the kids. But, but I also, also let all our um, community partners know background check people, and not just criminal background check. People don't realize most sex abusers, don't I'm not gonna say most, many will never be convicted. There's two different, there's two different databases in the state of Maryland. One is uh, the criminal database, right? You can see who's been convicted. That's a public database. But then there's the confidential child abuse registry. There are a lot of abusers who those charges will get dumbed down to things like, um, assault or contributing to the condition of a minor. Right. So no one will ever know that that is actually a sex offender. I'm going to call them that. They're really sex abusers, two different terms. You're a sex offender if you're convicted of a crime. You're abuser if you're found guilty of abuse by our, our processes. So uh, I want to commend you guys for doing that you, and, and continue to do that. But we have a lot of places that still need this help. Schools, not just the teachers, but you have aides. You have parents who come in to serve the treats. So these are, these are, there are still gaps within our systems that we need to get the message out that if they're, if they're piercing that bubble and having contact with kids, yes, it's a little bit of an irritant, but it pays dividend later. And I'll tell you um, uh, that we have caught people already they, they've been fired from one institution. We do a background check on them because they're applying to work with children in, a, say, a group home. Ping, oh, no, you don't, you know. <laughs> and, and so it's kind of a little, it's a little bit of perverse happiness when you catch the person, but it, it, it's, it, it shows that the system is working when it does. So thank you. I'm going to make uh, one comment to highlight something you said, but I want to first remind people, if you have questions, there are cards in the back. You can write your questions and pass them down. It's just a more organized way of doing that. So just to take a minute to remind you of that. Um, again, all of you made such important points. I just wanted to take the liberty of highlighting one from what each of you said. And, and you made the point of needing to recognize just how damaging the abuse of trust can be when a child is molested and how that can have lifelong consequences. And you talked about it from the point of view of a therapist. And I think that's one of the most challenging 
issues in this area to not fail to acknowledge the degree of suffering and the long-term effects that can come from the abuse, while at the same time trying to help the individual not see themselves as damaged goods. And so if you want to start can, can by... Can I address that? Yeah, what, what, so if you would like to, the, you, you the, can. The greatest protection and the weakest link we have in that situation and the greatest healing agent is what we call the NOC, the non-offending caregiver. That, usually a parent, and sometimes we will have to train the parent, fake it till you make it. But that child often is so associated um, emotionally with that parent that if they see the parent falling to pieces, then that Elizabeth Smart, um, after she was held captive out in Utah, and I know many of you have heard about Elizabeth Smart, one of the great, what she said what made the biggest difference in her life was her mother sat her down. And she said, either you will let, the, I know you've been abused, you've gone through horrible things, either you will let that man control your life or you, deci you decide right now that you won't. And that will determine the outcome of your life. And she said, she held onto that word and she didn't go through therapy, she didn't go through counseling. But that statement from her mother changed her life. And I, I think that's the same, as we're working with the children, it is, we are doing ourselves a disservice if we forget the, the primarily the mothers, I'm gonna say that, because they will confound or support how that child develops. I think that's very important. I'm tempted to say something. I see some of the other panelists want to, so let, let me let you guys get in first and I'll hold on. If you could, I, in comment, and in, as a follow up and a comment, you know, we get asked sometimes, uh, I guess when you're in high school or college, you know, think about the person who's made an incredible a difference in your life. And one of the things we, we looked at that and other issues and, and scouting. You are a blessed individual if you can say that's your mother or your father. You are, if you can, especially if they're together in today's society. The fact of the matter is, it may be a teacher, it may be a scoutmaster, it may be a priest, it may be somebody who is very appropriate in your life. I know there's, we're talking about and focusing on some very negative things. These are organizations, and it's, keep in mind, I'm a retired police detective. I come from this separate from the Boy Scouts of America, but now I work within the Boy Scouts of America. All of these things that are, my colleague here that works with Department of Social Services, the kids nowadays are under siege about what's going on. We need institutions, organizations, obviously to be more responsible in their knowledge of and response to and prevention of and what have you, but we need more of them doing what, what, what we're doing. On the area of resilience, uh, it's kind of implied in discussion, we know we have survivors of sexual abuse and scouting that have gone on to become Eagle, Eagle Scouts or what have you. And it was some of the things that they learned from those appropriate individuals in their life that helped them continue to live and survive. Now obviously, you know, they, you know we want to know about who that perpetrator was and, and what happened, uh, but there's a heck of a lot more to the role that you serve in organizations play collectively but also a, part, a big part of our responsibility. I think that's uh, terribly important. Did others want to add comments? I wanted to also add, thanks, Mike, for bringing in the relationship component of this, because what's happened with, with this issue of child abuse, child sexual abuse, particularly with the church, the relationship uh, that was developed, this is an individual, this priest that's, that's, that's uh, held in high esteem, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you throw God into the picture and saying that this is part of God's plan, I mean, that's a no-go. So with the reality that we have this with these relationships, the, the work that the church is doing is now having to work with, uh, with creating right relationships, appropriate relationships, um, healthy relationships, holy relationships. And so with the preoccupation with failure, which is one of the tenets that we, we work with and talk about, and you said you're paranoid, and I, I'm not necessarily paranoid, but I, I, I'm careful, right? I, I believe you, but I'll... That's a healthy reason. Yeah. <laughs> I'll believe you, but I, I'll, I will verify, right? The reality is, particularly with our children, if they have been brought to our care, that relationship is now the, the, that we will take that obligation and that responsibility to make sure, indeed, they will be taken care of. And so to wrong that, I'm, I'm grateful you bring that up because I think with all of this, and, and this is relationships in general, uh, relationships with parents to their children, relationship with children to other children, teachers, et cetera, so on and so forth. We're just trying to have to develop that work that is, it, it really is a work that's systemic in nature, if you will, because uh, we, we often look at, you know, we're doing now, looking at men who are going into formation for seminary. We're screening these guys like, I mean, 
I, I think I had a less uh, 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 involved process to get my TS clearance, right, my SF-86, than some of these, these guys are going through. I mean, they comb through everything, psychosexual assessments, making sure we have background histories, not necessarily also just going and checking records, but let's go talk to family members, let's go talk to community members. So it really is a very much involved process, and I think the work becomes easier when I'm able to give you guys a call and say, hey, can you help me? I, I mean, I visit Mike all the time when I'm down in that area and such, but it really is a work in, 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 uh, where it has to be in tandem and community uh, where we can work this together. Terrific. Okay, do we have any questions at this uh, point? Uh, as with all those talks today, I wish we could go on even longer, but I do want to try to take a couple of questions. Oops. Uh, did you want to read it or do you want me to? No, no. If you, oh, okay. are you, can you see him? Uh, yeah, I think we, so. we have 500 questions, <laughs> so we are not going to get to them all by any stretch. Um, and I was selective to try to make sure that each of our panelists gets a chance to uh, uh, to respond to a question. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> can you read them? Okay. Uh, I, I can try. Uh, okay. some of them, uh, it's not that really some of the writing is as bad as my writing. So. <laughs> that, um, okay. Um, It says, well, the first one's a comment and then a question. In Baltimore, it wasn't a pen, book, law, or policy that changed the statute of limitations. It was a camera and a documentary. Why is it that the major change only seems to happen when the spotlight is shown upon a problem uh, as being a subject? Uh, how do we change that? So the issue is, why, why does it have to end up being some big public thing before we change it? Why can't people working there when they see the issue get changed in a more timely fashion? Uh, anybody want to try to address that issue? I, I'd share an experience that I had when I was working in San Jose on, uh, on a local level, diocesan level, where I went through, uh, at that time, 50, 52 different parishes to meet with the pastors and to talk about the issue of child abuse, child sexual abuse, and to make sure training was in place and measures were in place. And I had a couple comments from one pastor that made this comment. He said, look, I, I don't know why you're coming to talk to me about this and stirring up the pot. I haven't read anything about this in the press lately, none on the headlines. Exactly. So I think this is where media becomes a friend of ours, and I tell this when media comes to talk to me, I thank them. Because if anything, they help to bring forward to the forefront. Just because we don't see it or hear about it doesn't mean it's not happening. They help us to make sure we keep this in the forefront and that we stay on our toes. Yeah, again, Sunshine sure. is the best disinfectant. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, again, just, we'll just have time for a few more. I apologize if I'm looking down while you're talking. I'm just trying to organize this. Um, I'm paraphrasing this question, but it, it made the point that often we put uh, kids into foster care hoping to protect them from abuse or they've already been abused. And the question was, has there not been a great deal of child sexual abuse uh, within the, uh, the foster care system? And uh, kind of a question of, if so, what, what thoughts we have about what can be done about that? I would say absolutely. I mean, it's a sad truth that, that for years um, we had overcrowded foster homes. We were not looking to work reunification like we should have. The, the, it was, that was not the only problem. There were a multitude of problems. But because of the, the neg when I came into work in Baltimore City, we had come under the LJ vs. Masinga consent decree because Baltimore City did such a horrible job of protecting our own children. So. Um, you know, once again, I think sunlight is great. Uh, there are more, much more rigorous uh, foster care standards. I know that we have um, separated foster families who weren't willing to get on board with us in my own county. And, and that's, uh, um, so I think that, and then I think the state as a whole, I don't I think just the state, but the nation as a whole is reevaluating what is foster care for? Because foster care was never meant to be a, just this permanent hotel for children. You're either adopting children and moving them, to, or I'm sorry, you're either reunifying them with the families or you were, you were moving them on to adoption, but it was, they weren't just there to languish. So um, I would say, yes, absolutely. And, and we, are, we are rigorously attacking that. Yeah, I think that was an important no, no, question. No, no, I addressed exactly the question. No, no, well, again, I paraphrase, but it's certainly an important issue. And uh, again, we've come up, we keep, always have w room to grow, but I think we, 
you're telling us, and rightfully so, that we've made a lot of progress. It's a really important area to, to be addressing these issues. Uh, just to be three more questions, then we're just going to run out of time. Uh, this one was uh, for Bernie. Why does the Catholic Church not support mandatory reporting? And I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, the church may uh, laicize or uh, a, an abusive pre priest, but research shows that they repeatedly um, offend elsewhere. Uh, if I might, I think you've already addressed that second one, that that's no longer going to be happening. But um, I, is the maybe, I, maybe this has to do with a confessional. I'm not sure. What, did you want to comment on the issue of mandatory reporting? And I don't know whether the confessional is an issue you'd want to address. Our, our safe environment training that we give out uh, throughout the country talks about mandated reporters for all who are identified as mandated reporters. Clergy are part of that, uh, uh, obviously. But the church also adds training that adds ethical or moral reporters as well. You want to make sure you're doing the right thing. So yes, you may not be a mandated reporter, but what you're seeing is untoward. The training that you're receiving, though, allows you to get to the person that needs, that needs to be reported to. So in terms of the mandated reporting laws, and we know the, very, the varieties from state to state, that's adhered to, that's followed. And the church adds another layer of that with the ethical and the, and the moral reporter. Now in regards to the confessional, so we're talking about sacramental um, theology here in regards to that relationship that takes place in a confessional. Um, that seal is sacrosanct, that is holy. But priests, clergy who hear confessions, are often trained now to ask the individual if they would be comfortable to talk about this situation outside of the seal of confession. That now unbinds the cleric to be able to now share and break that. He's not breaking any of the seals of the, of the sacrament of reconciliation. By asking permission and inviting the individual to please talk about this outside of that arena, it now helps and allows that cleric to assist and help that individual to get the help that they need. May I clarify the question? Yes. Um, uh, sir, you're, you said that the Boy Scouts of America has mandatory reporting laws, correct? Period. So, uh, period. We don't, we don't have mandatory, it's not a law, it's a policy. Okay. That's, we don't so anyone that sees anything, period. and you report to period. the police? Ma'am, what part of period are you not? <laughs> so you're saying, are you saying that you mean mandatory reporting in the same way he means it? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they, they, they reasonably suspect they are contacting child abuse and neglect, child protective services, and or the police. Okay. So it's not reporting to a higher up in the Catholic Church. They, report, they get reported to as well, but your number one chain of command, you're going to police civil authorities uh, first. Okay, so a laitized priest has, in many instances, not been held accountable for their abuse and have ended up in other states performing priestly duties because they they don't know what else they're going to do. But when there are no uh, mandatory reporting laws, who was I speaking to? Was it you, Ben, that said that there is uh, mandatory reporting laws where? I can clarify that, if that helps me. Yeah. Maryland has mandatory reporting laws that were instituted in the late 18, 1980s. I'm, I'm sorry. Maryland has mandatory reporting laws that weren't passed until the, the late 1980s. Before that, there was no obligation for anyone to report known sexual abuse of children. When they passed those laws in the 1980s, the legislature agreed not to include clergy or religious orders as mandatory reporters. There was some behind the scenes argument about that as time went on, and they did amend it to add organized religions clergy to the mandatory reporting list, but they, the Maryland legislature wrote in a specific exemption for clergy, and that is still true today, that a priest who is told, quote, with an expectation of privacy is exempt from the mandatory reporting laws. If someone confesses that they're raping a four-year-old, the priest is, is not required under Maryland law to report that to anyone. I'm going to interrupt. I mean, it's an extremely important issue, and I apologize, but we're going to run out of time. I think we could spend the whole hour on this, so please don't be offended by that. I'm only. <coughs> okay, well, because of time, and I'll, I'll let you answer that, but I want to ask one last question, too, just because I think it's important. I want to stay on track with the, the timing. Now, this is a question I think that's not only for the various agencies that are here, but just for society in general. And it, it really asks the question is there any programming for youth on healthy sexual? expression and this is a delicate one you know parents have concerns about 
who's going to educate their kids? Is it something that teachers should do in schools? So we had a Surgeon General several years ago who lost her job because she said we should talk to high school students about masturbation. But you know, if we're going to talk about child sexual abuse, children somewhere along the way also need to learn about what's a healthy way of dealing with their emerging sexual feelings. Children, particularly older ones, get start to have those feelings. So it's going to be the last question I'm going to take, but it looked like several people on the panel might want to address that. Sure, sure. I'll start. Um, so at Boys and Girls Clubs, we have a couple of programs uh, that we have in place, uh, but they really focus on healthy relationships. Um, and so it's, it's sure, there's, there's sex that's kind of mingled in there, right? But it's all about what a healthy relationship looks like and what it doesn't, uh, what it feels like, and, what it, and when it's not healthy, what that feels like, and then what are the what expectations of um, in a relationship? What are the boundaries that you can set in a relationship and how you set those boundaries um, and if you're and you feel those ba those boundaries are being violated or you're not feeling comfortable where you can go and who you can talk to to kind of um, to resolve that so we have two programs uh, one's called passport to manhood which includes a, a variety of topics but again it's all about healthy relationships and also smart girls um, which we roll out in uh, almost all of our or all of our clubs did others want to address that at all uh, th that for so you you hit a good great point a, a point that or we're engaging our experts on to discuss. I agree with uh, Jaris. It's all about healthy relationships and boundaries. But when you start talking about educating children, parents, children about sex and what they should be doing, that could be one heck of a discussion. All right, yeah, what's Karen, appropriate, what have uh, you? And because you get into values and different people's morals, and then you, it, it becomes a whole another discussion. We at the Boy Scouts, there's a, a line. It's, it's a moving, but it's a, a line that we push up against. We realize it's important to address this from a healthy relationship and boundary awareness perspective, and the research says it needs to start very early. The problem is, and nothing against you parents don't get upset, parents are wholly in failing in their responsibilities to have these conversations with their children. Not you guys. I know you guys are perfect. <laughs> uh, so what happens is these kids are entering into our programs without this information. Now, I'll ask you, may I ask them a question? Yep. Is it the Boy Scouts of America's responsibility to educate your children on this topic when you should be doing it yourself? And I'll make one final point. I think that's a great question. I'll let, be, I'll let it be rhetorical. But no, but, and, and I agree with everything that's been said here, but I also worry, as someone who's worked in this area for many years, we are afraid to even address the issue of children beginning to develop as sexual beings. Absolutely. Most young boys are getting their sex education in locker yes, rooms. They're not having serious, yes, mature, sir. thoughtful yes. discussions. Yes. And I don't know as much how it works with yes. girls, but if we don't address that, we're also going to eventually be missing a very important point. Yes. So you mentioned girls, because I want to speak to that, because one of the programs I oversee is a school for expectant and pregnant teen girls. So um, something that we've worked on is refusal skills. And, the, the, uh, and this is something these young ladies have very poor self-esteem many times. Many times when they go back into the school system or back into their neighborhoods, because they've had one ba boy, uh, one, one, one child, boys think they're easy targets. So this is something that we work on with our, our young ladies. In the community, we partner with community partners. There's been, um, be, unfortunately, even though we're one of the most rural county, we have one of the most, the highest teen pregnancy rates throughout the state, Washington County does. So we have our community free clinic, which also has a teen sexual awareness program. So uh, I mean, as a as a government, we're, we're kind of limited. I, I agree completely with everything Mike said. It should start with parents, but unfortunately, like Mike said, it's not happening. So there are programs that we try to push out in the community, but those are the the. I think you know, there's an old adage. I get that from Baltimore City too. Uh, um, a mama's baby is a father's maybe. And so my, all my teen girls know that. And so we work on those, those refusal skills. You know. well, what I, um, thank you. Uh, what I want to do at this point, I just want to thank this excellent panel. We could go on and on. I, I hope everybody found it useful and uh, really appreciate it. Very much. Thank you.